Hello, my friends. This is Amy Lee San Juan, and it is always a pleasure to welcome you back to another episode of Cisco Champion Radio, where we discuss topics across the Cisco portfolio to give you the insights you want and hopefully need. Before we get into it, just a couple of announcements. The IT Block Awards is now open to community voting. Please, if you haven't yet, check out the finalists and vote for your favorites. And secondly, we are now accepting Cisco Champion 2022 applications. So if you're interested in becoming a part of this amazing group of technologists, please apply. The application period is open for a limited time, and you will find those links in the show notes below. Okay, let's get into the good stuff. Today we have a truly special topic, something we've never really talked about on this podcast, and it is my hope that this starts a conversation for each and every one of our listeners. We are going to discuss the concept of non-inclusivity and how we can change the direction of biases in technology by creating an environment that is conducive for inclusive innovation. I hope this has intrigued you because we have some amazing champs and a phenomenal Cisco expert advocate to help drive the conversation today. Okay, let's get started with introductions. Molly, we're going to start with you. Can you tell us more about who you are and what you do at Cisco? Yeah, I'm happy to. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, my name is Molly Das. I lead Cisco Innovation Labs and thought leadership for Cisco's Emerging Tech and Incubation Function. I've uh, been at Cisco uh, in aggregate for about almost 19 years, believe it or not, and in the industry for over 21, um, and in a variety of roles from engineering to sales and now back to engineering. Awesome. Okay, now on to our host, Gerard. Who are you? What do you do? Always a pleasure to be here with you folks. My name is Gerard Cavallinas. I am the founder of Tech House 570. I also work for Helian Systems as a managed service systems analyst. You can find me at G Cavallinas and on LinkedIn at Gerard Cavallinas. Great. Meredith, you're up next. All right. I'm so excited for this topic. This is Meredith Rose. I'm a principal systems engineer with Worldwide Technology. Um, been a CCIE since 1999, and you can find me at Twitter since at M-E-R-3-D-I-T-H-R-O-S-E. My pronouns are she, her. Nice, Meredith. Tim, last but not least, tell us about yourself. Thank you, Emily. I am Tim Bertino. I am a systems architect focusing on network and communications in the healthcare space. I am at Tim Bertino on Twitter, and I'm also a co-host of the Art of Network Engineering podcast. Great. Okay, Molly, um, before the champs ask the first question, is there any background or context you could provide that can set us up for the rest of the conversation? I'm happy to. And first, uh, props to Meredith for sharing her pronouns. My pronouns are she, her as well, or her, she, as I like to say, just like the chocolate bar. Um, So (laughs) your question was around uh, the the context of inclusive innovation. Yeah. Um, So Listen, I, I have a strong passion for bringing my whole self to work and it comes in, you know, kind of the different kind of intersectional aspects of my identity. You know, I'm a, a gay South Asian woman with, you know, uh, ADHD. And uh, in that, there are so many different, I think, points of view that I can bring to the table. There is a really unique point of view. There are different communities that I relate to. And I've always found it really interesting that although whenever we're in the tech space we talk about inclusivity we talk about diversity of our you know employees but we really don't get down into the tech and we don't oftentimes get to indulge in the conversation of hey what if we actually made products more inclusive and what does that actually mean and i think the biggest question that i'm you know always passionate about answering or prototyping the answer for is uh, how do you do it? How, how, are, how can we be more inclusive with our product design? How can we be more inclusive with our solution implementations? Um, and, and really from a business benefit perspective, how do we expand the addressable market of what we offer? And so that's kind of the background and what I'm passionate about in the Innovation Labs organization. We we because we in we you know because design thinking is a big part of our practice uh by default when you think about customer empathy and the other aspects that are just kind of a part of the design partner practice 
there's something that kind of lends to an inclusive style anyway, but what it also provokes is this question about how can we actually just improve on this? And from a people process tools perspective, how can I bring um, different points of views to the design thinking table? What are the processes that I can employ? Um, who are the people that I can talk to when I'm conducting my user interviews? Am I actually truly being diverse? When I'm testing my product, am I actually keeping in mind the test criteria that would make sense from an inclusion perspective? All those types of things. So that's kind of the space that we live in. And uh, again, it's really from my own personal passion. It's just about, let me just bring my whole self to work. And that's what I tell my team. Uh, Let's just bring everything that we have and everything that we bring to bear because by default, that'll actually just make better product. So Molly, we talk about inclusion right down to the code. So just like you said, we're talking about the products and the technologies that are out there. Uh, let's get deep right into it. What are some of the, what are some examples of the challenges that we're seeing in different types of technology or issues that are caused that are, that are within the actual programming or the, or the product uh, products themselves? What are some examples that you see out there that are challenges? Woo. Okay. So, well, there's so many. Um, I think that, well, let's start with like the non-technical examples. I queried my team um, when we were looking into this early on about, hey, what are some examples of non-techie products out there or things out there? Um, And one of our developers started to talk about uh, college desks, you know, that have the arm either on the right-hand side or the left-hand side. So there's like kind of like this narrow part Uh, of the desk that where you can actually rest your elbow and then there's a larger part of the desk that comes out in front of you where you can write your notes or write your exam. Now in most college halls you will find or lecture halls you'll find that the majority of these desks are for right-handed people. Uh, The challenge is finding a left-handed desk and even if you find them there's usually only one or two they're usually in like this far corner of the room. Can you actually see like you know the media that's being shared by your professor and then Like, and this was like, you know, just being so studious when I was growing up, this sounds like my worst nightmare, which is um, having to write in, you know, for an entire exam for like one hour and not in the entire time, not being able to rest your elbow because you can't find a desk that suits your needs being a left-handed writer. And um, that's something that kind of just sat with me and was really profound. I was just like, wow, like that's, ooh, that's hard. Um, Another example, and this is one that's a little bit more personal to me because it's, it, really frustrates me and makes me feel like I'm doing something wrong, which is the automated soap dispensers that uh, I think early on when automated soap dispensers came out in, you know, restaurant restrooms or in movie theater restrooms, uh, they weren't actually tested with um, dark skin in mind. So when you wave your hand underneath the sensor, the light that it's projecting would reflect off of white skin, but would be absorbed into dark skin. So as a result, you would find a lot of people with, you know, my skin color being, you know, um, being a South Asian woman, that I would be frantically waving my hand underneath the sensor and the soap would come out and like, this is not my fault. <laughs> you know, this is, this, is, this is frustrating. Oh my goodness. So that's kind of like a non-tech example. On the tech side, there, um, there are aspects of inclusivity when we think about um, colors like in gaming, um, if things are like only red and green in a game, some folks who can't distinguish, right, that's really tough from if you if you identify with being colorblind, that's really hard. And I think in the gaming environment, especially um, as gaming becomes, hopefully it continues to do this more inclusive, um, that's, that's something that like is important to look into. And then you have, so it's kind of a, you know, visual kind of design perspective, but then here's where we're at now is, and here's, I think, where things become really front and center is AI systems. And if AI systems or ML systems are learning and making decisions based on uh, human decisions and human decisions are inherently biased, then AI systems will be biased. But what gets really scary is because AI systems are oftentimes just automated, learning on their own, and their scale um, is pretty incredible, now you have what I would call the equivalent of a a California wildfire, um, or just a wildfire in general. It's just moving so fast and it's really difficult to contain. Um, That's the potential challenge that we have with AI systems when it comes to bias that humans kind of naturally lead with anyway. 
being aware of that, being able to combat that is something that I think all of us own. So those are some examples. So I guess the logical next question is, what can we do about it? I mean, it just seems like such a problem that we can bring awareness to, but we have these tech companies maybe and they're you know, focused on producing a product on time, on budget, and then we kind of introduce this into the mix and it just may not be top of mind. What's a good way to kind of raise awareness around this? So we, I mentioned people, process, and tools earlier. Um, one of the things that we try to make sure we do is uh, leverage Cisco's employee resource organizations for additional input and insight. And so as an example, um, you know, our employee resource organizations cover a variety of employees, um, characteristics, demographics, et cetera. Forty percent of our employee base are actually a part of EROs, uh, which is kind of great because if you actually query this particular community, anyone who's a member of an ERO, you're actually pretty, you know, getting some good feedback if you needed it for a product, for instance. One particular design thinking exercise that we were doing, Meredith, was around um, a caregiving app. So it's like, you know, for many of us in tech, we find ourselves in this challenge where we are taking care of our children and we're taking care of our parents. And so it's kind of what's known as a sandwich generation. And we, you know, oh, by the way, we have to have this full-time job during the pandemic. And I, <laughs> super easy. No, it's not. It's not easy at all. <laughs> and so how can we have tech enable as a caregiver our experience and be better caregivers? And so we actually have a caregiver ERO or at Cisco. And so during this design thinking process, we actually query this organization said, hey, anyone want to be a part of an interview? where we get into specifics about your day in the life and what would be meaningful for you if tech were to enable and empower you to be a better caregiver. And so um, that's kind of one example is like, let's leverage the really rich communities that we just really have right in front of us. I also call this the friends and family plan. Like oftentimes when we design at work, we're, we're all really good at compartmentalizing and just thinking about like kind of like the narrow demographic of people we want to serve. But you know, the thing to ask ourselves is like, would I recommend this to my best friend or am I including my best friend or my mom or my family or my sister or whoever into a potential, into this design scenario? And if I did, would I do anything differently? And even just kind of the, those pressure tests are really nice to do. So that's people. Process is, well, uh, definitely embracing design thinking, embracing group thought. Uh, design thinking allows for that to happen. Even in a virtual scenario, we've managed to figure that out. Uh, but the other part of this is uh, sponsoring people with passion as well as smarts. And in the innovation organization, of course, we have senior tech talent. I mean, there are some amazing engineers in the ETI organization, but we also have some really passionate people in certain verticals like healthcare and manufacturing. And so what we also want to do is sponsor those folks um, to lead uh, focus groups on certain you know, innovations and things like that. So it's part of the process. The other is, uh, again, just making sure we go back to as we're conducting user interviews and we're following what we call a design sprint recipe um, for kind of more of a methodical way to innovate, we will go to, we will be more mindful about the people that we uh, include in those user interviews. And I will just say one of the things that we've just started in our organization is an inclusive innovation coalition named TBD. We're still voting on that, but uh, we'll use that as a placeholder name for now. And really what we're doing is creating, um, with the help of people from different employee resource organizations, we're going to create a living list of do's and don'ts to make products more inclusive in just a, a simple form. And so um, that will hopefully empower product managers across Cisco's you know, different engineering teams to guide on, hey, whenever you see my name or Meredith's name or whomever's name, like you want to see our pronouns if we want to share them. Whenever we see, you know, uh, uh, whenever we actually have a communication technology, we want to make sure we're more inclusive of languages, for instance, things like that. And then tools. Now, this is like, I think, especially in the world of tech, we love our techie tools. We love our software tools. We love our open source. And so I'm not going to talk about everything, but I will talk about two specific aspects. The first is around AI ethics and tools. 
Uh, so Cisco, actually, we have our own AI ethics committee. Um, and this is really a fantastic uh, team that guides our product teams and does analyses on how biased our AI systems might be or any product that relies on an AI system. But also, they also just provide a really simple template that says, hey, number one, acknowledge that your, that your product might have bias. Number two, address where, those, where that bias might be sourced from. Is it incomplete data? Is it, um, is it something else? Are you actually using a proxy like a zip code or gender to inform a different decision or a different outcome? Be aware of that um, and just acknowledge it. And then have a plan on how you might mitigate that bias moving forward. So it's actually a really helpful tool and framework for us to use. And then the other, and this gets into, you know, you're talking about like getting into the code. Inclusive naming is something that we're driving across the company. And this is, you know, Cisco's policy is um, is focused on four terms to start. Master, slave, whitelist, blacklist. When we see these things in code, which we often do, um, what we know is that these are microaggressions um, in code itself. And so to be able to uh, change those and substitute those words with instead of master slave primary secondary instead of whitelist blacklist include exclude or something like that uh, is really important and so this is just kind of a way of embedding belonging and allyship even just down to like your code uh, this is not only important just with our internal code but especially important externally facing and so there's categories of like your apis your clis even your guis the output of our products like telemetry, um, data, logging data, and then also um, uh, just tech documentation, to be honest, and training documentation. So I know it's a long-winded answer, but I hope that helps. <laughs> That's so interesting because when you think code, you're thinking ones and zeros. This is just a digital product of technology, and you have to realize there's so much human influence behind what the product becomes. So I think this is very enlightening. Yeah, and there's so there's so much to it, and you really hit the nail right on the head, right? So be it from a technical or even non-technical perspective, there's so much work that we still have to do and that we could be better on. But I guess my question, too, on it is, okay, so we know there's these problems. They've existed for quite some time. We have solutions. How do we keep things progressing and moving forward? I mean, what's a good way we could always maintain that um, just to assure? Because, like I said, creating a, a solution – and, and implementing it is one thing, but to maintain that standard of quality moving forward consistently, what do you think are some good ways we could, everyone can do that? Um, I'm going to say the word that we typically never want to hear, which is governance, um, okay. <laughs> but you need it. Um, now, the way to uh, make governance easier is to actually automate things. And so a really easy example is, you know, we have linter rules that will check for security violations or you know anything else um, when we're compiling or building our code. We use linter rules also for inclusivity checks now, which is really cool. And so now, so we actually use an inclusivity, uh, uh, inclusive naming uh, linter rule uh, checker uh, from Get Woke. Uh, it's an open source tool set and. Uh, so that way, whenever, you know, in our environment within et whenever someone's building, whenever someone's compiling, they'll get warnings if they're actually using these terms. Now, there's a progression, right? So we've started with this, and now what we're thinking about is, okay, well, noting that we have these four terms as a part of our policy, we're going to break the build. We're not just going to warn you anymore. We're going to break the build, right? We're going to break the compile. That's one aspect of, like, governance and automation. The other is that if we sense, you know, if we've missed uh, the occurrence of one of these terms in our code, um, we will automatically file a bug, right? Now, this is also a way of kind of automating or kind of having this be a part of your engineering flow anyway, which is like if you have a bug, whether it's like you're hitting a corner case or you're, you have a security bug or something like that, you, have, you see these terms, you have an inclusivity bug, go fix it. And the nice thing is that if you have like that engineering owner who owns that, like, module or that code anyway, um, they have to fix it. They have to test it before they check in, check back their code back in. When they do so, they're documenting it. That's actually really good. So those are like, I think, examples of like the techie governance. Then on the other side, it's like, 
whenever you have a centralized process, insert it as policy or at least at a minimum a guideline. So for our tech writers, our guideline guidance um, has inclusive naming guidance already in it, kind of central to the process. Um, which, to be honest, in large part is why we actually see a great amount of progress across uh, many of our tech docs. There's still um, progress we need to make, but I think this is where we've seen a fair amount of movement. Um, and then we have a central product management process as well that uh, we plan to insert inclusive naming requirements in our policy as well. And it's really just kind of stating the obvious. Um, and so, so that way it's just kind of known early on in the product cycle as opposed to as an afterthought. So I wanted to highlight a big benefit in those inclusive naming standards. So we all see every day how technology products, software just become embedded in our lives with the different uh, tools and applications that we use that we may not always be aware that we're even using. But as you implement or as we implement those standards in different applications, other people will be using those applications and um, they'll just, terms that used to be in software that aren't there anymore just become part of natural life. And people will start, it, it, essentially it'll affect culture. People will start using new inclusive verbiage um, and it's really the applications that are driving that. I love that you bring that up. I was just having this conversation yesterday um, about how this is not just an engineering issue. <laughs> you can see so many different non-technical scenarios where we actually use these terms. And um, there, there is kind of a cultural shift that regardless of role, we all have to uh, work on. And just like the really simple example of sometimes we upload a duck onto our SharePoint that we want every, you know my entire organization to use, for instance, and it's called master pitch. Does it need to be called master pitch? That's the question, right? Like, can we rename it? Primary pitch, golden pitch. Um, Anything pitch. <laughs> yeah. The pitch. Yeah. <laughs> <All right. laughs> um, so many other words. <laughs> so many options. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. But it's, it's, um, we use these terms so often, regardless of role, that it just ends up being not only an engineering requirement. I do think that there's a lot that starts in the engineering world, don't get me wrong, but I think that um, now it's just a matter of culturally we have to acknowledge and change. And one of the best uh, driving elements of this is the fact that Cisco has policy. It's not like, oh, this is a nice to have, yay. No, this is policy. And that's actually what helps us remove the impedance to get it done in the first place. Yeah, it makes sense. It's like you want to shine a light on it, but then you also want to just not walk away, but actually have something to address the maybe even an unconscious bias in that technical writer or that programmer has. Yeah, and to keep it moving forward and stay consistent. Yes, that's absolutely right. So we, we have these standards, we have these policies. Is there a good way to measure progress on, on how we're doing going forward? I didn't know that was going to be part of the questions, and I'm kidding. Um. Listen, like, that's a hard question to answer. <laughs> yeah. I didn't read the instructions. No, um, that's a number one. You have to have your success criteria defined. So I'll use the example. <laughs> I'll bring it up again. Inclusive language or inclusive naming. We have identified five areas of like, what does completion or compliance mean? And so it's four categories of code. So internal code, and then three categories of external facing code, APIs and CLIs are that front end, the back end, like logging and telemetry, and then tech docs, training docs, your web app description, so on and so forth. And then the fifth category for completion is um, those linter rules that I was mentioning, those kind of automated checks to prevent further usage. So, okay, fine. We have these five. Are they equally important? Yeah, sure. Um, so that's a, what we're thinking about is like, you know, wholeness or completion of inclusive naming for a specific product means that you've covered those five categories. They're well documented. And that would be, that's how we would measure success. Um, in the context of AI and ML models, that is, you can use certain tools to determine how well you are um, identifying the right thing. So for instance, we have this innovation product um, called explainable AI. 
And it is basically, you know, you can have a kind of for computer vision, for instance, it's like, that's a hot dog, that's a cat, that's a dog, right? You can like recognize these things, but like the nice thing about having explainable AI and then having a metric that just comes from that is saying, well, here's why we think that this is a hot dog. Here's why we think that that's a dog. Here's why we think that that's a cat and kind of explaining the decision in the first place um, and being able to not only have this degree of like, yeah, that's correct. These are all what you say they are, but also having the right um, kind of level of explainability behind it. That's also really important because then what that can inform is the degree of kind of how complete your data might be. Um, I'll pause there. That's a great question. No, that, that makes sense. I, I, a big reason I ask that is because I always try to frame that in my head when I'm going to take on any task is if I'm going to say that I have a goal in something to me, there has to be something concrete. There has to be something achievable yeah. and, and measurable. And I, I just wanted to get your take on that as far as, uh, inclusivity in products. I think that there's always a, here's my measurement. Here's what, here's my criteria for success. And, you know, here's how I'll measure that. And then there's always an and. So it's a yes and type of story. Because I don't think that that just means that your work is done, you know. Yay, no one's racist anymore. It's like, well, hang on a second. Like, there's, you know, we all have our biases. We all have, um, this is, we have to automate and have these governance checks in place to, like, make sure these things don't happen. It's definitely one of those things, having the checks and balances help. Because even at the end of the and you, and you guys, everyone has just said it, you know. It's not something that's going to go away on its own. We need to be proactive as well. We need to be sure that what we're doing is going to steer this in a more inclusive and positive direction because, and this is, that's why I was really honored to be on this episode because there's a lot that I'm unaware of, right? That the way I, the way, you know, to frame things into a better perspective, having three daughters of my own and, and how to teach them, because that's also a big part of it is, you know, not just the impact we're leaving and the way we're taking this, but for the next generation, you know, and to make them aware and to understand, to be conscientious of, you know, the way they approach things and the decisions and making sure everything's inclusive, be it technical or not. Yeah. And I just remembered what I was going to mention earlier, which is the and part of, you know, kind of evolving our inclusive checks is just around being thoughtful. So something that I found really cool, our cable team has done a fantastic job of um, in incorporating inclusive naming. And um, they're actually one of the reasons that they've helped us identify like what completion means. But what they've also done is they've said, you know, we want to just look through our code and just understand when we're using the instances white and black, what's the context? Now, if it is to describe and like label, you know, different categories of colors, this is the red data, this is the yellow data, this is the black data, this is the white data, this is the orange data. Okay. Maybe that, that context is benign, okay? But let's just at least study outside of whitelist, blacklist, why would we be using the terms white and black? What is the context? Because if it is in the context of inclusion versus exclusion, that's problematic and that's something that we should think about. And I think you're right, that's actually you know exactly where you're going, which is like, what is the next piece? This is an evolving space. And let's try our best to not just like complete the policy and say, yay, we're done. We get this A, you know, but it's actually, how do we think about improving it? The other thing that I'll add is, um, when we employed our linter rule in our SRE uh, platform, there was a fair amount of feedback from our global engineering audience that, hey, this is a very US-centric issue. Okay, fine, I'll snap in its policy. But hey, by the way, there are some terms that are also microaggressions in code that you're not including that happen to be really offensive to a global audience. And so now there's this responsibility, and that feedback's huge. How would we know, right? That, so now we can say, okay, well, how do we actually contribute back to our open source linter, uh, linter rules? Um, or how do we just add them for ourselves? That's actually, that's like kind of in the spirit of moving things forward and ultimately making sure everyone feels like they can belong. Yeah, I think that's kind of leads to my question is how can we become better allies? We're, we're consumers of this technology and it seems like the right direction, as they're suggesting, is to provide kind of a continuous feedback to the makers of the products or of that documentation, maybe 
we can file a bug when we see something like that. How can we help? I love, I think that's like the first step is like, number one, asking how we can help. Like, I think like we, we actually just had um, our first kind of pride, LGBTQ plus, or what we call it, Cisco pride, allyship, uh, safe space to ask dumb questions hour yesterday. It was like our launch event. And um, we're still, obviously we're still figuring out that name too. Um, but it really is a safe space to ask dumb questions. And, you know, the the key point that we wanted to end our conversation with is like just asking the question, how can I support you? Um, I don't think we, we ask that conversation in the context of like, I'm going to mentor someone or like, you know, maybe it's someone on my team. But why wouldn't we do that in the context of allyship? And again, going back to people process tools or people that I work with, like how can I actually make them feel like they belong like that's huge it's a really important question to ask and sometimes you'll get a really like easy answer like no i'm good or it might be kind of you know based on a certain circumstance or scenario well i kind of needed that in this particular you know in that meeting i need you to have my back there or it might be you know i'm only like in the context of LGBTQ allyship, it's I might only be out, out to you, but I'm pretty closeted to the rest of everybody and my own coming out journey is my own. Oh, all right. Okay. Got it. And just being kind of aware and understanding of that and asking, if you don't know where to start, just ask, how can I support you? I think from a process perspective, kind of embedding and being aware of like, okay, are we pressure tests? Are you always like, could you talk to different people? Would it add value? Would it add diminishing return to? understand that. Um, but no doubt it's likely going to add value. Um, and then on the tool side, that's where, you know, in tech, I think even like if you find it, calling it out, right. I like to, there's that common term. If you see something, say something, this is no different. And if we call out as a community, more microaggressions, whether it's in code or in design environments, or even in brainstorm environments, um, that, those are all really meaningful. Um, and, I'll just say like one of the easiest ways to do this, and I try and do this every day, is um, find someone in the room who's not talking during one of your meetings and ping them on the side. Like sometimes the folks are introverts and they're just like, no, I'm good. Don't need talk, processing, listening, maybe silently judging everybody. I don't know, but like, that's fine. <laughs> you do you, right? But like pinging them on the side and just saying, hey, checking in, how are you doing? You've been a little quiet, you good. Um, and sometimes people are like, I'm just trying to get a word in it. And so what I say is, well, let me know if I can, I can help with that. Like I can, I'm very happy to interrupt people. <laughs> or if someone says, you know, um, no, I'm good. I'm just listening, just taking it all in. You say, all right, cool. Well, I'm here if you have any questions or anything like that. And I think everyone can benefit from your point of view in case you feel, you know, so inclined. And then some folks are like, I'm good. And just kind of leave it at that. And it's like, all right. That's cool, you know, um, no answer is wrong. But it's more about like that, just kind of check in and just making sure that if there's just someone that's just quiet in the room, um, making sure that they know that they have a voice too and that they're being seen. Because I think at the end of the day, it's like if you can have inclusion, you can have diversity, but you're going to bite yourself in the you know what if you have only one or the other and you do not have both. So if you have a diverse team, but you're not being inclusive, then there's always going to be someone who's not participating in your conversation and your innovation, your strategy, your product will not get the benefit of their point of view. On the other side of it, if you're being super inclusive, but you're not super diverse, you can be a team that's thick thieves. But if you don't have anyone that's like bringing in that different point of view and is um, challenging the status quo, then you're not innovating. And so it's kind of country and rock and roll, Taylor Swift, you got to have both. But uh <laughs> that's a that's what we try and uh th that that's the why you got to have both there's a couple key words there in what you just said molly that that kind of triggered with me and that was uh being thoughtful and being aware I, I think it's so easy in certain scenarios to just accept things or verbiage because that's just the way it's always been and I think we need to be more thoughtful more aware of things that we see and say to kind of just take that second step back and and think about things from other people's perspectives and make a conscious decision on what I'm about to say next. Does it make sense? <laughs> is it thoughtful and is it aware? So I, 
I I really appreciate you saying that. I um am laughing inside. It's 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 a ridiculous thing, but I'm just gonna say it. Um okay. So my niece, she's seven years old, she recently just cut her hair. Um now of course I have to side with her mom and be like, Oh, you know, that was just terrible, you know. Kids shouldn't cut their hair, but in my head, I was like, wow, she did like the kind of side, Justin Bieber, like side swipe fringe bangs thing. She gave herself bangs, basically. And in my head, I was like, wow, it's a pretty good job. <laughs> she did a great job. <laughs> and uh, but I couldn't say that out loud. Even I was like, go Corinne. And um, so then this past weekend, I was like, you know, I hate my hair, but, you know, can't go to, I don't feel comfortable going to the salons, you know, waiting for Omicron to really get super past the peak at this point. So I... <laughs> cut my own hair um how'd that work out i mean <laughs> so i'm laughing because <laughs> i need asked, to know <laughs> yeah i right, well so you know I, this is very lazy so i likely didn't employ as much thought as i'm sure my niece or i don't know what kind of thought my niece employed but my why was different um and uh it was really lazy where i just put my hair in a braid and then i cut the end of the braid <laughs> Do not do this at home. Like, don't, don't do it. Anyway, <laughs> I'm laughing because, uh, you know, can it, you're, think, you're talking about like, you got to know what to say. Think about what you're saying. And I asked my partner last time, I was like, so does it look okay from the back? <laughs> I don't even know why am I asking. Like, Loaded uh, question. <laughs> yeah. And she would just sat there and uh, she was just like, um, and I think she just felt like she was just, you know, kind of in a trap, you know, like, what do I say? And so Tim, like, that's why your question was making me laugh because yeah, like what she was doing was basically thinking about what how to be thoughtful with the words, <laughs> how to be thoughtful with the words. Think that's My right. mom always used to say it, think before you speak. I don't care yeah. what, to- what topic, what area you face. That's, that will always reign supreme. Think before you speak. She made Good sure. Advice. Absolutely. And, um, you know, and the topic of inclusive tech, that is no different. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's most important. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, in case everybody's wondering how Molly's hair turned out, her hair is pulled back currently. So yep. I'm going to guess it didn't turn Might out so well. well. I mean, <laughs> it could be worse. It could be worse. But yeah, it's not, uh, it's, uh, it's good this is a podcast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Molly, so you, you mentioned, um, you know, not being able to go to the salon because you're not comfortable right now. Uh, and maybe this is a little bit premature, but top of mind for me and maybe a lot of folks out there is returning to the office. If that'll happen one day, we don't know. Um, are there any considerations when we're thinking about technology that um, we can make to make sure that the return is more inclusive? Yeah, absolutely. Um I mentioned the Pride ERO a little bit earlier, and um, previously I was one of the global co-leads for Cisco's Pride organization, and um, this was actually during like when the pandemic first hit, and we were naively thinking that you know in May of, or in June of 2020 we'd all be returning to the office at this time, but I think you know at this point. To some degree, time has stood still, you know, from like, what do we need from an office perspective? Uh, but what the dialogue that we started to engage in was what does our community need when we go back into the office? Like if some of our community are immunocompromised, do we need to actually have like rethink our Wi-Fi placement implementations or Wi-Fi implementations So that way, you know, if we're socially distant from our colleagues or physically distant rather from our colleagues, that we all still have excellent network connectivity regardless of where we are in the office and we can still maintain safety but still collaborate. Um, And it's such a basic way to look at um, a a solution implementation requirement, but similar to how we think about for healthcare, here's what we need to consider from product implementation or for financial services or for a manufacturing floor. Like these are actually really interesting scenarios and the requirements of a manufacturing floor, it's like heavily IOT centric, really fixed configs, all that stuff. Like, um, and sometimes not even connected, right? Like how do we think about that versus how do we think about like a corporate office environment and just employing these instead of a vertical aspect to the design, but more of a 
people or human need aspect of the design is really important. Another example that we start to think about is how do we ensure people feel safe at night walking from the building back to their car? Especially because at the time, you know, I think the world um, in large part was kind of waking up or becoming collectively aware of the Black Lives Matters movement, but you know that has been around for quite some time. Um, but like in the wake of uh, George Floyd being murdered, well, I think the world realizes like, okay, we're all here sitting at home, we're all paying attention. Okay, this is actually pretty real. And what happens to all of us, um, but specifically like Black Americans, for instance, when they go to the office and they wanna leave the office and be safe getting back in their cars and get home safely, what do we need from a physical surveillance perspective? So what do our Meraki cameras need to do? How does that Wi-Fi actually need to be extended out into the parking lot? And oh, by the way, this doesn't actually just impact the BIPOC community, but also women, people from the LGBTQ plus community, and any human being that's actually concerned for their safety. And let's face it, that's like all of us, right? So what's really Im important about that and interesting about your question is like when you actually think about associate implementation, for I think an oftentimes overlooked um, or neglected demographic or audience, uh, we end up finding that the resulting solution and the adjustments for it take care of everybody. So that's what we were thinking about it, if that helps. It definitely does, especially in you just, you know, saying that. And I've always said, especially having two boys of, of color that's that's important because it's different and How you many have kids to... do you have sorry <laughs> no, five. Five, no, five. That's a good I question have, i have five <laughs> two boys three girls <laughs> wonderful so, sorry keep coming keep going no 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 that was it it's just you know especially with everything going on you know it was different when i was growing up and i'm sure when, when all of us were growing up we didn't I, I didn't see a lot of those things you know you always had bullies you always had but to be targeted in a lot of that stuff. So having these solutions is key, especially for their generations. They're not going to, there's, there's, I mean, our safety is one thing and it's always going to be, you know, at the forefront, but theirs is going to be at another level because we'll be able, we'll have solutions by the time they're 18 and in their twenties and thirties. I mean, where we'll be able to take this through inclusively is, is going to be awesome. And it excites me because, you know, then they don't ever have to fear or worry about, you know, these things. Cause we'll we have products and solutions designed to tailor, to keep them safe and, and prevent a lot of this. That's a hope. Absolutely. I I'm, always say I'm it's the way. spider. That's right. It's the Spider-Man rule though. It's like with great power comes great responsibility. Um, <laughs> there's always going to be a way that bias creeps up into our systems. Um, but like we've been talking about, it's about being thoughtful. Well, I just want to say what a great topic this has been. I know you're looking to wrap us up, but just thinking about so much focus on diversity and inclusion in hiring processes and so forth. And we've just taken it, kind of peeled back the layers and said it, it's deeper than that. It's not just I hired this many people that have this identify with this group or it's just like really embedded in some of the things that we can really shine a light on and take a deeper look at what's all around us and, and become more aware and more thoughtful. That's it. So thank Awareness you, Awareness and thoughtfulness. Yes. Thank mm -hmm. you, everybody. And thank you guys for listening in. If you would like to continue your journey, um, check out the links in the description below. And you can also, got to remind you every episode, uh, you can also subscribe to Cisco Champion Radio on your favorite streaming platform and receive alerts on our latest releases. So wherever you're listening to us, make sure to click on that subscribe or follow button now. Thank you for listening in. See you next week.